Okay. Uh, last name is Vergasol. I come from UCSD. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, so the, se the style is going to be slightly different. It's going to be a little bit more of a seminar. But along the way, I'll put uh, at the board, I'll go at the board and try to fill in all the details. Just interrupt me, and uh, uh, I'll tell you what uh, we learn about navigating in uh, uh, mid-uncertainties. Um, and uh, let me get started with, uh, uh, in particular, navigation. So as you've heard in this school, there's many examples of navigation uh, of all different uh, sizes. You've heard about bacterial chemotaxis, run and tumble, this climbing of the gradients. Eukaryotic chemotaxis, this is the picture that Andrew was uh, scribbling at the board painstakingly. This is the, the one. This is a pipette. And there's a, a, a dictostelium, which is converging toward the location of the pipette. And then there's examples at uh, different scales, like, for example, olfaction-based uh, searches done by insects. This is uh, on, the, on the left over there. You have a moth um, over here. It's a male moth, and uh, it starts, can start from tens or even hundreds of, mi of meters. And then it flies toward the source, the source being a female, which is releasing pheromones. And the issue is to understand how this is being made and how this, uh, this, uh, this fit is realized by, by the, uh, the moths. The same thing is actually uh, at different scales is done by rodents. It's different in the sense that uh, rodents tend to uh, navigate at, at closer distances. And it's probably also different the kind of uh, olfactory cues that they are uh, sensing. Because as you see here, they're close to the ground. And now close to the ground, the transport of odors is quite different than uh, for the case of the moths. So there's an interesting issue how much they're using about the uh, odors close to the ground and how much when they raise, they're sniffing something in the wind. And then the issue, the, the, the other phenomenon, which is what I will discuss mostly today, for lack of time, is the soaring by birds and uh, gliders. But before getting into uh, the navigation itself, um, I would like to start with a simple problem, because I, I would like to put the problem of navigation into the broader perspective of decisions that Andrew has been discussing, uh, to uh, have you realize what is why navigation, what it has common with the normal decisions that are being made uh, in biology, and what is different, what's special about navigation. So I will start with a simple problem. This simple problem is the problem of the uh, bandits. Multi-arm. And I suppose not everyone has heard about, about this. So let me define what they are. You have uh, a, a bunch of slot machines. You have K slot machines. And each one of them has a probability P1, P2, PK of uh, giving you a win. So if you play uh, one slot machine with probability P1, the arm 1 or the arm 2, you're going to win with probability P1. And you're going to win an amount which is unit. Okay, So the, the amount you win is, is totally fixed. Uh, so this is, a, this is also called Bernoulli arms, for obvious reasons, because the outcome is a Bernoulli variables. And, um, and the issue is, uh, at the very beginning, I don't know the probabilities. Uh, how should I play? And how should I play? Of course, what I want to, to do is that I would like to maximize reward. Maximize reward, or uh, if you take this is if you're an optimist. If you're a pessimist, then you say that you're going to minimize regret. And just for the purpose of the analysis, let me put the probabilities. Of course, you as a player, you don't know. But as the analysis, we can do that we put these probabilities in this order. So 1 is going to be the highest uh, probability, the most likely one. 
and uh, maximizing regret is going to be minimizing regret sorry is going to be the sum over the number of plays that you have which is so far has not been defined uh, minus r alpha of k so the index alpha runs over the this one and the maybe k is not is not the right one let's call it i alpha i so what is this uh, if alpha i so the index that you played the arm that you played at game at the a i equal uh, um, whatever i is equal to one then of course the regret is going to be equal to zero but if you play lower uh, arms two three or four uh, on average you're going to lose so this on, on the long on the limit of long n is going to be uh, equal to p2 for example so the regret let's say two arms the regret is going to be essentially the number of times that you played the second arm multiplied by p1 minus p2 okay and the issue of course is that you would like to uh, to play the lower arms the suboptimal arms as little as possible but of course you don't know where they are and you have to figure this figure this out so this is an example of what is called and that's why i'm discussing this here uh, of what is called the balance exploration exploitation which is important in all these problems because uh, what these problems are about well you might try to be very greedy so a very greedy attitude will be that for example you played the few times this uh, this arms and there's one of them which is going to have the estimated probability of winning so let's say that you played this one you played uh, n1 times and w1 is going to be the number of wins and two the same thing w2 so you can estimate the likelihood of this pi is going to be ni over no it's going to be wi over ni and pseudo counts uh, it, this is going to be all this is going to be in the limit of n going to infinity so pseudo counts if you want to add them they don't they don't really matter so if you're greedy, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to pick the I, the arm, which has the highest estimated probability. And you're going to you're going to play that. So, OK, you're going to pick the R max. Yeah. Now, this, uh, of course, would make sense if you knew exactly these probabilities. But you have to find them out. So the downside of this is that you might miss the opportunities. You might miss the best of them and so eventually you're going to end up you might end up playing with the suboptimal uh, arm and what this balance of exploration and exploitation is the fact that in order to discover what's the best arm you have to explore so you have to waste a little bit of this you have to pay a little bit of regret in order not to pay a much worse regret on the long run so this is what is called for planning which is another important aspect of all these kind of problems because what you want to do is that you want to make a move not just to maximize what you're going to get for example the orders that you're going to uh, the detections that you're going to have in the immediate future but you also want to plan what is going to happen in the far future and try to uh, have a strategy which is not too greedy and looks in the future so how do you solve this problem? In fact, this problem is relatively easy to, uh, to solve. Um, well, the way you go, let's say k equal to 2. Just to simplify, k you can generalize to other number of arms. And uh, what you can do, of course, is that you can build the posterior out of this. So the posterior for pi alpha is going to be uh, pi alpha times the number of wins for this 1 minus pi alpha and then this is normalized by the beta Euler function just for normalization okay 
Now, what does it look like when you start playing? Well, after a certain time you start playing, a typical picture could be as follows. You have arm equal 1, which is going to look like this. This is probably going to be centered somewhere around P1. And then you have the arm 2, which is suboptimal. So it's going to be centered around here. And it's going to look like something like this. In fact, the tail is a little bit exaggerated. I should be doing rather, well, you, you know what I mean. It's going to be something like, like this. And it's going to, so this is arm 2. This is p. This is the probability is pi estimated. And this is the posterior p of pi, the way they look. Kay. So these are plots of those kind of functions that you have over there. And because this one has a higher mean, it's quite likely that you've been playing this more times than the second one. Okay. But now the issue is going to be, am I sure that just this number of counts which is inferior to this, is it not due to fluctuations? Because in fact, it might easily happen that because of the finite number of counts, the fact that the estimated pi star of this is lower than this might actually be due to fluctuations. So how do I estimate the fluctuations? Well, this is the so-called theory of types. which you can look at in uh, Cover and Thomas, the book on information theory. And the probability that an estimated, uh, prob uh, estimated probability comes from a real probability p over n counts is the, pr the formula reads like this, d of pi star where this is the kullback leibler How many of you are familiar with this? Everyone, perfect. Okay. So I can skip the derivation, which is relatively trivial. It's just taking the formula of the binomial, expanding with Stirling, and you keep going. So how do we use now this formula in our case? Well, our formula in our case is that we have, as I said, n1, w1, and the estimated pi star 1, n2, w2, pi star 2. And so I want to make sure that the probability that this that I see here is not, is not due to a probability which is actually lying on this side. So what I want to do is that I want to estimate the probability that pi 2 star is uh, generated by pi 2, which is larger than pi star 1, over a number of counts, which is n2. Right? So this event, I would be actually fooled by the counts, because in reality, the, real, the probability is actually larger than pi 1. And I've got fooled because of the fluctuations. Right? So this is what I want to avoid having in my situation. And the probability for this to happen is, I just read from the formula here, it's d pi star 2 and pi star 1. Okay. So now, how do I, uh, what do I want to achieve? Well, what I want to make sure, as the number of counts get larger and larger, these are getting lower and lower. And therefore, I have to take into account how many, how many counts, how many place there were. And the heuristic that works, there's some mathematics that can be done, but I tell you the heuristic. You essentially want to make sure that this, is, this probability is unlikely with the number of, of, of plays that you have. So in other words, what you would like to have is that the total number of plays multiplied by this probability stays. Right. So in this case, you, what the level of fluctuation that you should expect with the number of samples that you had is less than 1. And so you can kind of trust 
what you have, because this level of fluctuations is consistent with uh, the level that you should expect with the counts that you have. So what this says is that N2 should be larger or equal than the log of N divided by the kullback leibler of pi star 2, uh, pi star 1. And in the limit when n is getting large, this becomes log n over d p2 p1. Okay. So this is uh, a shortcut for uh, a result in mathematics, which is called the Lie-Robbins inequality. Lie-Robbins inequality says that if you want to have a, uh, that the regret must be larger than uh, or equal than P2 minus P1 over D of P2, P1 log n. Okay. So for what is called asymptotically efficient strategies, which means that on the long run, you're never going to miss the right R. So if eventually you want to realize that uh, what is the best arm in the long run, then you have to pay a price. And the price you have to pay is that this N2 must be larger or equal than this. So how do you play this game? Well, the way you play this game is, is kind of now obvious from this. What you end up doing is that you play the best arm from here, so you're greedy. You're greedy, you're greedy. Up to the moment where you keep playing on the greedy one, n is going to increase. And so there's a moment where the suboptimal arms, the count, become critical. Essentially, you play them too few times, and you have to start playing them in order to make sure that you're not getting fooled by fluctuations. And this, this kind of strategies, they, uh, they achieve uh, optimality. And you can prove uh, all sorts of results about this optimality of this, uh, of this uh, strategies of decision. For example, there's some uh, upper, com um, upper confidence bounds. Confidence bounds. So these are strategies where you take this as the indicator and you add to this an index which measures the level of fluctuations. And then you decide based on this kind of index, which are kind of a form of free energy, in the sense that they have this energy term, and then they have the level of fluctuations. And you pick those that have the best indices. Yes? So the strategy is going to, be, uh, is going to boil down to the following. Imagine you've played a certain number of times. So you have a situation where you have a best arm, let's say pi star 1. So well, each arm at the beginning, anyway, this is all asymptotic. So at the beginning, you populate all of this. You get to a finite number of, of plays. And you, you get to a situation where you play a certain number of times. You have some estimates of the pi's. Okay. So now you, start, you keep playing pi star 1, the best of them, until the number of counts, n2 is going to stay fixed. So there's a moment where you start increasing this, where n2 is going to become critical. And then you have to start playing n2. And this is the way it goes. And this is, is implementing this balance in an optimal way, actually, in that case. But qualitatively, this is implementing this balance of exploitation and exploration. Um, OK. So why this problem find it interesting? Because it's, uh, it's a very primitive and very simple form where you can actually control the uh, results, um, where you can uh, see the, this balance and how you should, uh, you should actually implement it. And it gives idea in general that being greedy is not the right, is not the right thing to do. Now, um, Sorry, sure. Do people actually do this? Do people take these tests? So there's examples uh, coming to biology. There's example of uh, birds 
you give them a chance of eating from different, uh, from different sources. And what you do is that they actually implement a strategy which is very close to optimal. So they test from one, they test to the other, and then they start playing actually after a while with this kind of strategy. Um, so it's another, th another field where this kind of stuff has been used is in uh, allocation of resources. Because of course you would like to find out how you should allocate some resources. This is like uh, allocating where do you play your bandits. And, uh, and uh, so in economy, this is a very popular field. And I'm giving you the very simple version because other more complicated versions are these become functions of time. So now then you have to update continuously your, uh, your probabilities and then it becomes even more. Yes? So in, in, in all of the biological examples that I'm familiar with with these systems, um, they, they are incredibly hard to, to actually implement in the sense that the, the, what animals do depends on all sorts of things, right? It will depend on things like whether the food accumulates on the on each uh, terminal, or whether how long it takes to run from one terminal to another, and, and, and things like that. So, like, to which extent one can actually say that animal is is doing something, right? Rather than the experiment was engineered to get the you, to do you cannot tell. The only the only statement which is being made is that this kind of stuff is giving you uh, so you can calculate and you can prove optimality. So this kind of arguments, they give you a bound on how well you can do something. And what is being found in some experiments is that you get very close to optimality. This doesn't say that the animals are implementing, for example, upper confidence bounds. This is not what is being said. But it's just being said that they're getting very close to the optimum. So if then you want to discover exactly what they're doing, uh, you have to do much more work, not just observe. You, 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 should, you should sample them. You should, for example, change the condition, which is something that, as far as I know, has not been done. Um, so, so what's yes. exactly the strategy they think to switch? Like so the strategy to switch, there's a number of strategies to switch. I'm giving you the qualitative. Uh, so the, the qualitative statement is that you should be doing this. These upper, upper confidence bounds, what they do is that they have they co build up an index which is based on pi star of i. And then they add the term. They subtract the term which is proportional to the uncertainty. And I don't want to get into too many details because you kind of can I imagine what it is. Uncertainty is going to be how much this, how much I should diminish this because I've played a few times. So it's going to be kind of the entropy of this. And it's going to be related to the number of counts. So the same value of pi star, if you played many times, the uncertainty is going to be lower. So this is going to be kind of the entropy of your distribution. Okay? There's other ways. Th that's not unique. For example, one thing that, uh, that has been shown uh, is that you can play the game. This game can be played, and this optimality can be, can be achieved by using strategies where you try to acquire information. Uh, greedily acquire information on the probability of the best R. So there's many ways you can achieve. The point is that you should, the decision boundary should match that one. Okay? N2, when N2 is getting lower than log N over that, you should start playing the, the suboptimal R's. Okay? Other questions? Okay. Why am I telling you this? Uh, well, the reason I'm telling you this is that this problem, as I said, contains two uh, good ingredients of what navigation is about. But it's also good in order to show you what it doesn't contain. So what it doesn't contain is, which are aspects that are very important for navigation, One point is the nature of the cost. So as written here, the regret, the regret that you have is just the, what is called is in microeconomics, is just the opportunity cost. So 
So the opportunity word is a fancy word for saying that if you do something, you cannot do something else. Right? So if you played ARM2, you couldn't play ARM1. So, and, and this is the only cost that you have in this, kind of, in this kind of problems. But if, for example, you play two and you didn't play one, at the next round, your probability or your chance or your possibility of playing one, two, three, or four is not affected. The statistics of your winning is not going to be affected. So the statistics at the next round is just going to be qu absolutely the same and it's not going to be affected by your previous actions. The, the, how you decide is going to be affected, but not, the, but not the, the statistics. Now, in navigation, this is clearly not the case. Because, for example, if in a problem like this, right, rather than start moving upwind, this, by the way, is the direction of the wind, I start moving crosswind and I get very far in this direction, most likely what is going to happen is that I'm going to be out of the cone of detection of the odors, and I'm going to lose completely my detections, and I'm going to get lost. So the fact of doing one action or another action is going to affect the statistics of my, uh, uh, of my interactions with the environment. And this, so the cost is not just that I didn't move closer to the source, it's also that I'm going to skew completely the statistics of my future detections. The second thing that in this problem is different from those kind of problems is the uh, passive In this problem here, what we've done is that we are totally, we are totally passive. So we are receiving uh, the, uh, the results. And the only thing we can do is that we decide at the next step what to do. But we have no way of affecting the statistics. We have no way of changing the statistics. There's not much we can do other than receiving the stream and playing accordingly. Now, this is very similar to the formulation of the problem that Andrew has been discussing which is the formulation where you have the cell and the time of time is fixed. In the, in the formulation of the problem that Andrew has been discussing of finding out what's the concentration, whether the concentration is above or below a certain threshold, what you do is that you fix time. Right? So your time is fixed. Therefore, what you have is that imagine you have a receptor, a single receptor, and you want to find out whether the concentration C is going to be less or equal than C star with a certain precision, let's say epsilon. So what you want to do is that you want to discover whether your real concentration is going to be above or below C star plus epsilon over 2 or C star minus epsilon over 2. And what Andrew has, has been discussing is the case where you are considering the situation where the time is fixed, and you find the relation between t and epsilon. So now this is, this is totally passive, again, because you have the stream of data. You process the entire stream, because notice that what Berg and Purcell do is that they take the average over the entire uh, process. So you are processing the entire, the entire set of data, but you're processing this in a passive way, in the sense that what you're doing is that you're waiting for the end, and then you're applying your favorite test, for example. It could be maximum likelihood. Now, this problem, even though this is not going to sell well in, a, in a, an audience of physicists, in fact, statisticians have thought of this before physicists, and they've come up with a better way of dealing with this, which is rather than being totally passive, you can actually deal with this problem in an interactive way. So what you do is that uh, rather than waiting for a fixed amount of time, what you can do is that you can accumulate evidence. And if, for example, in a realization, it's quite obvious that your concentration is above this limit, you cut it short, right? Because you, you monitor your, and you can do this exactly in the same way by applying maximum likelihood methods. So the end result of this kind of analysis is that rather than you, you get the same scaling as the Berg and Purcell that you have, but the prefactors that appear here can be substantially lower. 
In particular, you can get easily factor 5 or 6, or in some other context, you can get even orders of magnitude. So why is this important? This is important because it's telling you that rather than being passive, you want actually to be interactive as much as possible. And now if we come to the role of navigation, navigation can, let's pick this problem, for example. You have a source of orders. You're sitting here. You're receiving one order. And now you, you know that there's a female somewhere over here. And you want to get to the female in order to, to, to mate. By the way, this male, these moths, they spend their last two days of life essentially doing that. So they're clearly under pressure, selective pressure. Um, now, this is important because normally the animals, you don't know what they want to do. In the case of the moths, it's quite clear. Um, now, you receive an order. What, you should, what should you do? Well, if you take a passive point of view, what you should do is that you, I should sit here, wait for a time such that with the statistics of the environment that I have, I accumulate evidence of where the source is located. And then I go, I move, and I go straight to the source. I can make fixed time. I can make variable time. Or the way navigation is done, navigation, in fact, no animal is doing this. The animals, what they do is that they move, and they try to accumulate uh, information along the way. So this is to say that you have to have, uh, uh, you have to interact with the environment. And the best way of doing this is to do it by moving and by changing the statistics of the environment. And therefore, it's intrinsic into the navigation problem that you want to interact with the environment. You want to change the statistics of the environment. And this, of course, complicates life because the statistics is not fixed anymore. But that's intrinsic to the problem of navigation. And that's what, in the big picture of what decisions are and what navigation, how it fits in terms of uh, decision, biological decision, these are the general and the specific aspects of navigations that I wanted to uh, emphasize. OK, so having said this, if there's no question, Maybe I can start discussing one of them. And if you want to talk about the other ones, I've been, this one I haven't worked much, but these two, these two problems and this one as well, I, I, I've been working. But in the, I'll be talking about this mostly. I'll be happy to discuss the other ones. So, and you will see all these aspects into this problem, because you will see all the uncertainties and all the uh, problems of typical of navigation. So what is soaring? Uh, soaring is the following phenomenon. Soaring is the, uh, is the phenomenon by which uh, flying vehicles, and you will see later that birds do a very similar things, there's in the, in the atmosphere, in the lower st uh, strata of the atmosphere, from time to time there are, uh, as you will see later, there are ascending currents of air. And so what you can do is that you can pick the, uh, the ascending currents of air. And if you manage to stay within these ascending currents, you can just be carried by uh, this, these ascending currents, and you can gain height. So even a uh, flying vehicle that doesn't have an engine and it cannot, doesn't have any thrust, it can actually stay aloft for long periods of time if it manages to pick up these ascending currents and these fluctuations. And in particular, what glider pilots do is that they pick these ascending currents. They get to the height of the clouds, which is about one kilometer in, uh, in normal conditions, but it can even be more. They glide to the next thermal. They pick up the next one. And they keep doing this. And in good days, you have a streak of, uh, of uh, uh, thermals. And so they manage to cover hundreds of kilometers in a day just by doing this without any propulsion, without any engine of any type. Now, this is thermal soaring. There's other form of soaring. This is uh, La Jolla, just across the street of UCSD. And what the uh, gliders do is that they use the fact that when the wind is blowing from the ocean and it's hitting the cliff, it's going to do the same thing happens with the mountain. It's going to go up. And you remember Bernoulli theorem in fluid dynamics. Your, uh, uh, your streamlines are getting uh, shrunk. And therefore, this means that the velocity is increasing. And therefore, what it means is that you're creating lift. And therefore, if you stay on this side of the cliff, you manage to go back and forth here and enjoy the view 
of La Jolla, the Mesa, and the ocean. Um, now, this is for the uh, flying vehicles. Birds do very similar things, and actually they do much better than the pilots. This is a falcon, and the falcon you see here has picked, is starting to spiral, which is the signature that it has picked a, uh, an ascending current. And you notice that these spirals are going this way because the wind is blowing in this direction. Um, and this is not just the falcons. This is very common in the migratory birds. The migratory birds, they tend to fly. One observation that you might have is that they tend to fly o not over the ocean. because, And when you go and, and study in detail what these migratory routes have in special, is that they have very often they have this kind of thermals. And therefore, they, the, the birds, they can exploit these thermals along the way and save on the metabolic cost of flapping, of flapping the wings. Um, I said that this is not possible on the ocean. In fact, there are exceptions. In some regions of the ocean, in particular between Madagascar and the India, uh, India there's, a, there's, a special, uh, uh, there's a special atmospheric phenomena. There's quite a number of these uh, this thermals, even though there's the ocean. And this is an example of a paper which appeared uh, recently uh, where they studied frigate birds. And you can see that these frigate birds, they can actually get to heights of the order of 2,000 meters. Once they get there, again, what they do is that they glide. They save on the metabolic cost of flapping the wings. And they can, uh, uh, they can cover much longer distances at the same cost. Yes? What is the intuition for why there is no thermals above ocean, generally? Right, because in order to have the, OK, so let's get to 101. OK, let me get to this. And then I'll come back. Yes. So what's the basis of the thermals? The basis of the thermals, very simply, is that you hit the ground. Once the ground is heated, the air is heated, and it tends to go up. So in order to have a thermal, what you want to have is that you want to have some ground where the heat is stored. And so typically, glider pilots, what they do is that they look at, uh, on the ground where there's dark spots because dark spots are going to absorb energy. So typically, water is not, the good, water is not good for storing this uh, uh, heat. And typically, the atmosphere is, 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 co is, uh, is warmer. And therefore, you don't have typically thermal. That's a very special one. That region is very special. Because in principle, it can happen. It's just that typically, it's not the case. The ocean is, is not storing energy and then releasing. The ground has to be warmer than the upper air. And I mean, in the upper latitudes? Yes. Correct. You, see you can see thermals depending on condition. That's why these migratory routes are so special, because you don't find them everywhere. Right? You have to be at some particular places. And, and also, you can see from this plot that clearly you don't, you're not going to have thermals at night. You're gonna ha not going to have thermals uh, early in the, in the day. So this is the profile of the vertical velocity. And when it's red, it means that the vertical velocity is high. And when it's, uh, when it's yellow, it means that it's low. So clearly, the ascending currents are more frequent at the hot times of the day, in the midday, when you have the ground which has got heated up. And then it's, uh, it's releasing air, and it's going, and it's going up. Okay. Um, so let me get back. OK, so now, what's the energetics of, uh, of this? And um, you can estimate. I'm not going to get into the details of this too much. But there's, uh, you can estimate what's the, uh, what's the sources of energy for a bird. And in particular, what's is, what is going to happen if you're flapping the, the wings. In per so this is the thrust, and this is the drag. And these are other terms. This is the soaring terms. And this will be the dynamic soaring. But let's estimate what's the metabolic cost of flapping the wings. You take an eagle like this. These are typical parameters. S is the surface of the animal. CD is the coefficient of drag. V is the typical velocity at which they fly. And M is the mass. And you put an estimate into here. These numbers are kind of known from aerodynamics. And you can estimate that for a migration of 1,000 kilometers, if the animal were perfectly efficient, it would consume 
about 500 grams, which means about one quarter of the weight of the animal. The animal is not perfect, so there's about a factor two of imperfection, which means it would lose essentially half of the body of the mass. So that means that it's a huge cost in order to cover this. And so you understand that having these sources of energy is kind of crucial in order to cover these uh, big uh, distances. Um, if you want to know about this formula, I, we can discuss uh, uh, tomorrow. It's, it's very simple. It's just the balance of energy that you have. Now, uh, I want to show you something because uh, it's kind of beautiful. This, can you guess who drew this? It's certainly not me because I can barely draw some mountains and some rivers. The Italians are supposed to know. <laughs> yeah, this is Leonardo da Vinci who drew this in 500. Uh, so the first paper on soaring was actually Lord Kelvin in 888. But in fact, Leonardo kind of saw all this. And uh, he picked up, this is the soaring that you've seen before. So you can see that it's very realistic. It's very similar to what you've seen for the falcon. And this phenomenon here is what is called dynamic soaring. So this is what you see the albatross is doing. When they go to the, in the ocean, they, they dive, and then they make this turn in this direction, and then they dive again, and they manage to fly over the ocean in this way. And this is called dynamic soaring. And Leonardo is speaking very beautifully this, this alternation between going down in the direction of the wind, which is blowing this way, and then counter-turning and going against the wind and going up and then picking up again. And this is essentially in order to get heights. I will not discuss dynamic soaring, but these this, uh, uh, drawings are uh, too beautiful not to, not to show. OK, so, um, okay, so let me get now into the uh, uh, into the uh, problem that and the work that we've uh, done. And this is going to connect with uh, learning uh, and the lectures that David Schwab has been uh, discussing this week. So all these flows are very highly fluctuating. And this is a bacterium has a in uncertainties because it's too small. So the environment of the bacteria by itself would be kind of smooth and regular. But the poor bacterium is too small. It has all sorts of fluctuations and therefore has uncertainties. In this case, the uncertainties are coming from the fact that, as you've seen, these thermals are being generated by convective instabilities. Those are that they're extremely turbulent. And so you, cannot, you should not imagine that these are kind of elevators that you take, you jump in, and you get to one kilometer height. These are very unstable. You, you, you have to navigate and you have to uh, 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 to get into these thermals, to know what to do, to respond to cues. And as I was saying, it's not something as uh, you, 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 you do in a deterministic way. You have to continuously adjust with uh, the environment. And one thing which is quite non-trivial is what are the good cues that are going to tell you that you are in a thermal? And what are the cues to which you should be responding? You could be responding to vertical velocity. You could be responding to temperature. You could be responding to gradients of velocity, to uh, uh, acceleration. All these quantities are potentially good candidates. And it's not quite clear which one is effective, which one is not effective. And then the second question is, how should the bird respond to these cues? So what kind of algorithm should be going on in the brain in order to respond to these cues? Now, um, at the moment, at least when we started this, there were no experiments uh, available. And also, it's quite non-trivial to infer from the behavior, as we've seen. You've seen plenty of this in, in the courses. It's not so obvious if you observe even the images and even the input of the, of the animals to figure out what kind of algorithm is going on. The question of Ilya before was another example of this. So it's useful. Uh, in order then to attack the problem of what the birds are doing, I think I found it useful to attack a simpler and better defined problem, which is what an optimal agent which is, doing, which is doing learning, how it's going to cope with this kind of problem. So in particular, what kind of cues are going to be useful, and how should it respond to these cues, 
And let's formulate this problem in the language of an agent, of a flying agent, like for example could be a glider. What would the glider do? And can we uh, learn by using tools of uh, uh, learning methods uh, what, what an agent like this should be doing? Okay? So this is the problem that I want to discuss. And just as a disclaimer, we are doing right now the experiments with the birds. So it's not like I want to skip the hard problem and do the simple problem. We, we'll get to the birds. It's just that this is the first step which I think and I hope to convince you that it's useful to do. Um, okay, so let's get started. How do we cope with this? Well, first of all, we have to uh, have a flow which at least vaguely resembles the uh, thermos in the atmosphere. Now, simulating the thermos in the atmosphere is a kind of worm, and uh, even though I've been doing fluid dynamics for a number of years, um, the problem is hard. The problem is very hard. And more than that, the problem at the, at the current stage, the way it is being solved is not appropriate for our own purposes. The reason is as follows, is that when you simulate the atmosphere, uh, you cannot resolve from, you saw that the scale goes to one kilometer. You have to cover distances of several kilometers in the, uh, in the lateral direction. So this must be at least one kilometer. This must be several kilometers and the same on this side. Now, several kilometers, you should know that in the atmosphere, the Reynolds number is very high. Therefore, the dissipative scale is order millimeters. So you have to cover from kilometers to millimeters. It, this is simply impossible. So what people do is that they use tools and methods like, for example, large eddy simulation, which means that they take the energy at the small scales and they take this energy out. That means essentially that they're smoothing out the field over a certain land scale. This land scale in the current simulations, the best that one can possibly do, are of the order of 50 meters. Okay. Now, the animal is flying and responding likely over time scales of the order of fractions of seconds or seconds and it's flying at 10 meters per second. Therefore, the cues that the animal is sensing are on the scales of meters and on time scales that are absolutely not resolved by this kind of simulations. So even though these are more realistic, um, for the purpose of the flying that we want to address, these are not, these are not uh, uh, viable. So the way we took the problem then is that we are not, anyway we have to do the experiment at the end, so let's take an example which, where we can simulate things and get something which is at least qualitatively similar to what we want to explain. And so what we want to explain is to have some thermals. Therefore, we picked up another example of fluid dynamics flow, which is called the, uh, the, uh, the, the convective flow. Essentially what you have, it's a model where you hit the ground, you cool the, uh, you cool the upper part. It's like a boiling pot. And uh, this is called Rayleigh-Benard convection. And really, Benard convection is these equations that you recognize as being uh, 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 Navier-Stokes with an additional term, which is the buoyancy term. This is describing the fact that hot air weights differently from cold air. So this is r the term which is producing the fact that you create these ascending currents of hot air. And then you have the transport of temperature, which is this one here. Temperature is being advected by the velocity here, and it's getting diffused by a term which is small because the, uh, the equivalent of the Prandtl number is, is, is large. So these are the flows initially that we generate. And then, w as you will see, we'll get into the real experiments. We'll go into the atmosphere with the insight that we're going to gain from this. OK, so these are the flows. Now let's get a, an agent. So what should we do with the agent? Well, the agent must respect the laws of aerodynamics. And the laws of, uh, of aerodynamics are pretty tough. The laws of aerodynamics are tough in the sense that there's no miracle. If you want to fly without the thrust, you have to lose height. Because the only way you can propel yourself is by, by uh, gravitational energy. So if you want to have kinetic energy, you have to lose on the gravitational part. So the, 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 the we, we we, uh, there's, no, there's no miracle. And in particular, you can, uh, what is being plotted is the sink rate, so how much you're going to go down, versus the airspeed, so the longitudinal velocity that you have. And the typical plots are, are this way. So they, they go up, and then they sink on this side. Where you want to go very fast, then you lose a lot of uh, height. There's an optimal angle, which is this one here, 
where you have the best ratio. The, this is the best glide angle. So if you want to flap your wings and you want to go as much as possible at the maximum velocity per meter lost, this is the best uh, angle that you, can possibly, that you can possibly choose. And this is typically the angle which is getting picked by the animals when they are going from one thermal to another thermal. This is the angle at which they, uh, they fly. But this is telling you how much you uh, change the, uh, uh, the velocity and the vertical one as a function of your, uh, of your inclination, your angle of attack. Now, typical numbers, just to give you an idea, uh, a swift is too small and too little, but it has a ratio 12 to 1, which means it can fly 12 meters losing one. Uh, hand glider, 15 to 1. The frigate bird that I was mentioning before is 20 to 1. And actually, the planes that are uh, the sail planes that are getting sold uh, these days, they have a fantastic ratio of 40 to 1. Okay. Uh, vultures are somewhere in the between 20 and 40. Um, so this is just another way of plotting the, the, the same thing. And you see the, that all the, you know, it depends on the, on the animal. I don't know why they did male condor and female condor, uh, that's, but, but that's, they did both. Uh, but they, they pretty much look, look similar with the peak and the best angle, which is, which is done this way. And this is just another way of plotting the same, the same thing and giving you the information on how much you sink if you want to go certain number of meters uh, horizontally. Yes? Is it just the, the wings and the weight and everything that controls the, the different ratios? So this ratio, they depend on, uh, uh, you know, it's the lift. So it's how much lift you, you get. If your if you're, if you're plane, it's the same thing as a plane. The plane has actually very similar things. And by the way, this one here, this angle here is the stalling angle. So this is the angle at which your plane is going to become too steep. And therefore, this is going to create that you lose lift. And you better not be in a plane which is going in this one. Because as you can see, the lift is totally lost. Okay. So the, how these curves, where do they come about? Essentially because how, depending on how much you incline your, uh, your plane like this, the lift, so the velocity of the, uh, of, the, of the air which is flowing below and the velocity of the air which is flowing above, they differ depending on your angle. And the two combine the two, this is what creates lift. So depending on the angle of attack, you have different curves. And what happens here is that it's too steep so it's essentially hitting like this. There's recirculation around, and you lose the lift. Other questions? OK, so now uh, the question is this. So now we've defined the problem. We have an agent which respects this rule. We put this agent into, into these flows. And the beauty of this is that, uh, contrary to real life, we have plenty of ensemble of realizations of this flow. So we can try different things. And in particular, we can try and come up with different sensory motor cues, which means let's try the temperature, let's try the velocity, let's try the acceleration. We can try many of them and, and see which, uh, which, is, uh, which one is effective. Now, the problem of forward planning, I already mentioned before. That's why, in part, I did the bandits. There's clearly a problem of forward planning. You cannot be too greedy. You have to make moves in such a way that on the long run, which is of the order of a few minutes, you're going to gain height. So you don't want to do greedily your moves. The problem of credit assignment. The problem of credit assignment is the big problem of machine learning. So Imagine you want to fly into a thermal, and you're starting from the ground, and you want to learn which are the good moves. Now, the good moves at the end of the episode, which is going to be a few minutes, you're going to measure the height that you gain. But you're not going to know exactly which were the good moves along the way that made you gain the height at the end of the episode. So this, the so-called problem of credit assignment is to know exactly which are the moves that made you have a good episode rather than a bad episode. And this is the big problem and the problem of back, back propagation that David Schwab was, uh, was discussing. That's the main problem that you have to face in machine learning, in particular in the cases where you have episodic uh, gains where the, the reward is going to be given just at the end of the episode. So how do you cope with this problem? And here comes reinforcement learning. 
So reinforcement learning is a uh, method which got inspired by uh, neurobiology. And uh, actually, it got inspired by neurobiology. But it's much more controversial these days in neurobiology than uh, it's not clear exactly. There's some examples in neurobiology where it looks like that there's some reinforcement learning going on. But it's, it's still quite controversial. But it became a very good uh, uh, tool and method in uh, machine learning. So what's the framework? The framework is that you have an agent, like our flying agent, which can take a certain number of states, S. Now, this is a vector, S. And in particular, in the case of the, of the agent, of flying agent, it could be the sensory motor cues. It could be the acceleration, the velocity that it's, the animal is sensing. It is the bank angle, so how much the, the plane and the glider is inclined with in this direction or in, in this direction. Here, you've seen that depending on this, you have different lifts. So it's important to know the angle of attack. And it's important to know the bank angle in order to know where it's going to fly next. These are the states. Okay? And here, you can put anything you want. Okay? This one is kind of well-defined. It's the state of the glider. This one, you don't know what it is. And of course, the action A. The action A is that you, this one you cannot modify. At least you, you can fly at locations that seem advantageous, but you're not going to be able to change the statistics, for example, of the atmospheric boundary layer. What you can do is that you can migrate at locations that are uh, estimated to be, to be uh, advantageous, and that's pretty much what you can do. So the actions that you can take is that you modify your angles of attack, your bank angle, and you try and change this by some actions, A. So what the agent can do is that it has a certain state, S, which includes the environment, and it takes some actions, A. In response to this action state and, and, and uh, action which is being taken, it gets a certain reward. Now, this reward, we don't know what it is. But most likely, because it's trying to gain height, must be something which is associated with gaining height. But you will see that it's not that trivial. It could be, for example, the velocity and how much height it's got, uh, is it, 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 it managed to get in, in over this time scale. Typical problems are discretized. There's, a, there's an internal clock. All these problems are mostly discretized. So you should think of this plus one as the reaction time of the animal, the step of the animal over which the animal is going to change its, its behavior. Now, um, so let me go again to the board, because that formula is pro do I have, what time do I think? 5.30, right? Yeah. Okay, I have time there. OK, so let me explain a little bit this, because it might be useful. OK, so what is, what is that formula over there? Have, by the way, David did the reinforcement learning uh, the first? No, he didn't. OK. So let me explain a little bit that. And if you want to read more, I'm going to be short. Uh, but if you want to read more, there's a, there's a book online, which is by Sutton and Bartu, which is, are the two people who propose the temporal difference algorithm, which is the basis of reinforcement learning. It's available online, uh, so you can, you can read it. Uh, and I, I recommend the second version rather than the first one. I think the second is much better than the first. OK, so what are we trying to do? Um, well, in general, the formulation of reinforcement learning is that you have, as I said, the state space. Yes. You have actions A. Uh, the space of states and the space of actions doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be the same. It, they, these vectors can have different dimensions. And what we are trying to do, typically, one typical formulation is that we are trying to maximize the discounted cumulative reward. So there's a reward function, which is R, uh, let's say, SIAJ. So this is the reward that you get if you are in a state SI and you take the action AJ. Okay. 
And what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to do is that typically you're trying to maximize the cumulative reward. You start at a certain location s, uh, let's say s s zero. This is your initial state, and you're trying to maximize the discounted cumulative reward, which is the following object r. So beta is the so-called discount factor. So how should you think of the discount factor? Well, this is kind of a greedy term. It's giving you an idea of what is the time scale that you're interested in. Okay. So beta, as you can see from here, uh, and beta, I should say, is between beta 0 and 1. This is telling you how much you care about the future and what's the typical horizon over which you're doing your, uh, your process. So if beta is very small, this factor is going to dump you immediately. It means that you're extremely greedy. You're extremely short-sighted. You want to get something at the next time step. If beta goes to 1, it means that it doesn't really matter when you're going to get stuff. It can, it, your horizon is getting infinite. And the sense of how much this, this horizon depends is that you, you can put something constant here, and then this sum is going to become beta to the t. So the horizon, if you just want to write the formula, is of the order of 1 over 1 minus beta, which, of course, fits with the formula before. Yeah? So you just have turbulence problems or yes. many others. There's probably not a single time scale. Absolutely. Right? Well, uh, that was my reason for doing this. And if you really want to know the way this project started, is that this project started because my, my hope was to prove that these uh, methods, they would totally fail. So they were good for playing games. In the games, there's no time scale. There's just you have to kind of calculate in the future the exponential branching of all this. And as a past turbulent or current also turbulent person, I said, well, exactly what you said. There's many time scales. Let's see how all this is going to cope with real stuff. And unfortunately, uh, Gautam made it work. Um, <laughs> so in a sense, I was happy that it worked. But in an, on, on the other side, it, I, I was kind of disappointed because this method seems to be better than what I thought. Um, so this is this, and then there's the policy, right? So the policy, the policy is what? The policy is that you would like to know what is the action that you should take if you're in a given state, right? So given a certain state, I would like to know what action I should take. Being, for example, at a certain bank angle, I detect something. How should I change my angle of attack, my bank angle, and so on? And then there's another object which is important, which is the transition probability, which is t. So given that I'm in state S and I take action A, uh, what's the probability that I'm going to land in state S prime? Okay. So this defines for me a, this process. And one thing to add to what Ilya has been saying is that this process here, notice that this is Markovian. So at the next step over there, you're not going to know about the past. The only thing that you're going to know is s of t plus 1. So the reward over there is just a function of your current state and your current action. doesn't take into account all the past. Unless, of course, you can enlarge the state and put some memory state into your s. But a priori, these are Markov models. They don't know about the past. They're just a function of the current state. Yes. So you could have phrased this as a continuous control problem. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the only the big difference with respect to control problems is that in this case you don't want to put any big model. So this stuff is model free. Right? So there's many people in turbulence, for example, they've tried to be very sophisticated in modeling the flow and to use control method theory. Control method. And that one is, I, I should say, it's not, you know, you control sometimes, but most of the time it doesn't work very well. And I think the failure is that you want to be model-based. And turbulence doesn't like to be modeled very easily. Um, 
So yes, it's a control problem where you're not trying to be uh, too pretentious to know exactly what is going to happen. You let the system discover the dynamics and adapt to that dynamics. Yes. Yes. So it is a, it has a bit the next step it yes. depends on the the last previous step. It doesn't yes. depend on the past. So what, yes. what can be the problem of the like, there's no problem? There's no problem okay. in the sense. Okay. Well, I, I don't understand okay. what you mean there's no problem. Uh, I still have to choose the action to make, right? Okay. So if I'm sitting in a given state, what is going to be the action that I should make in order in the future? to to do something good right at the end of this i would like to accumulate still a lot of reward right so i still have to choose the actions properly given a certain state and the mark of dynamics is just saying that uh, your actions uh, your next reward is just going to be a function of the current state but an action that you take at this time could have very strong effects in the future because, for example, as I said, you went astray. And so taking actions is still very important. It's not that because Markov assumption, it doesn't mean that you can do anything you want. Any other question? OK, so um, given all this, there's one important equation which is uh, written, which is the following one, that the cumulative, given a policy pi that you choose, pick, pick the one you want, and given a certain state S of t, what will be the future reward? Well, it will be uh, R of t plus 1. So let me define R of t plus 1 as R S of t A of t, just to simplify notation. And then there's, uh, there's a, a, a an inequality that you can write, which is similar, actually, to Dyson equation in physics. What you do is that you resum all that. So what you write is that you, you write it like this. And you have R of S of t plus 1, A of t plus 1. And the choice of the discount factor as being a power, an exponential, you see what it does is that there's the power or the exponential is the eigenvector of the translation, time translation. And therefore, you can factorize one beta. And what is left, it's actually the same as if you started from s of t plus 1. Therefore, what you have, it's a recurrent equation, which is this, which is beta c of pi s of t plus 1. This is still not obvious to solve because these are big uh, vectors. Therefore, you should populate all this by this, this cumulative value. And this knows about the future. But now you have a recurrent equation like this. And what you can do uh, is that you would like to um, this quantity here, the expected value is called the value function. So this is the expected value of the cumulative pi under the starting from state s and value pi. Okay. This is called the value under policy pi. Well, that this all this could be stochastic. All, right, all this all these matrices here, this could be probabilities. This could be probability. So in general, this, these are probabilities. The, this process is not deterministic. They were those and they could be re probabilistic as well. Yes, they could. Uh, most of the time, they're not, but they could. Um, and they could also be time under this, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. So this includes all the sources of stochasticity that you might have in your, in your own process. And what you do is that this is under policy pi. And of course, what you would like to do is that you would like to pick the best policy. Right? So you would like to pick pi star, which gives you the maximum over pi of v pi of s. Okay? And if you pick the policy pi star, which is the optimal for all s, 
This is called the optimal policy. So this is the policy that gives the maximum value for all the states S. And this is the holy grail of the whole thing. This, this is the dream that you get out of this without having any model coming up with a policy like, like this. Now, this is still not telling you. So the way this is, uh, this is being learned is, in fact, and this explains the uh, formulas that you see over there. Rather than learning the value, usually what is being done is that you learn what is called the action value function. So the action value function is a Q of S and A. So you don't just count the value of a given state. You count the value of a given state and the given action in that state. Okay? So th that contains more information because it gives you not just the state, it gives you in a state what are the actions. And what's the equation for this quantity here? Well, the equation for this quantity is this. Right? And then there's beta. And exactly like for the value function, now we use the fact that because of the beta to the t, all this is going to factorize on this side. And therefore, what we get is that we get a sum over future state and future actions of the transition S prime A and S, then the transition yes, this, and then Q So this is just saying, this is the short-term reward. Then I transition, I take an action here, AS, which is both are parameters. So I'm going to transition to a new state S prime. In the new state S prime, I can take actions A prime with this policy here. I have to sum over all of them. And all the future, it gets condensed into here, exactly as the value was into this one here, the cumulative value. So these are the formulas that you have here. And uh, of course, if once we get to know this function, then the best policy that we can take is that for each and every state S, we take the action A, which gives us the argmax of this. So once we have the function Q S of A, we know everything we want. The big problem is how do we learn this function Q? Okay. And yes. Say it again. The rewards here are not being discounted. No, they are discounted because there's this, this, this factor beta again. So this is exactly like this, right? They're still discounted here. Oh, yeah, because I said this one I parameterize by S prime, A prime. So this would be S prime. This is the state at time t plus 1. And since I'm summing over all of them, I'm dropping the t plus 1, and I'm calling it s prime. Here, I was just still keeping the sum in here. Any other question? OK, how is the learning getting done? Well, the way it's getting done is uh, you'd be surprised by how trivial it is. Um, so what you do is that you, uh, if you were to do Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo, what would you do? Well, you would start from a given state. You would do some episodes, and you would see how, at the end, doing a certain policy pi, which is, is called policy evaluation, how much this policy, how good it is. And uh, particular, I would start with a given state test. I would take an action A. I would run my episode, and I would see how it performs under that policy and that A. And I would update my value Q. This is the way I would do Monte Carlo. And then I run, I run, I run, and I get to a certain action value state. Now, this is extremely time consuming, and it would require a huge amount of statistics. The insight which was, uh, which was got by Sutton and Bartow in different, I mean, there's different proposition and different proposals, but the essence of the algorithm is, is the following. 
is that rather than doing like in Monte Carlo that I do an entire episode, let's update on the fly as we are doing things. We update the all, the all the action and values along the way. So we don't wait for the full episode. We update continuously. And the way we update is as follows. We take along the episode, we take the value that we encounter along the way, and we update them by this prescription. So what is this prescription? That's why it's called temporal difference. Now, if this had converged, this is called the learning parameter here. Now, if this whole procedure, procedure had converged, when I take R plus beta, the new state, I should have that this is equal to this. So the difference between the expected value and the value that I really take, that I really obtain, and the expected value, this is telling me how much have not converged. So I update my current state by a fraction eta, which is the learning parameter, of the difference between what I expect and what I got. And this is what the way you update. And along the way, what you do is that, of course, you're not greedy from the very beginning, as in all the simulations of this type. So you have some temperature tau, and you pick a policy, which is the exponential, a Gibbs function like this. And of course, you, you cool your system as the learning proceeds. And this is what it is, nothing more. Okay? And this is the reason why I thought that would fail. Um, OK, so let me skip this. We can get to this. The choice of the reward uh, will get back if you want. But let's see the results. So you apply what I told you. And for reasons that uh, I can explain in the question later on if you want, the reward is the vertical acceleration. Okay? Take it empirical. At the, at the end, after trying, yes? Uh, your Q function is a, is a neural network. OK, good. So uh, we try different things. And you will be disappointed. As physicists, we try to be as simple as possible. So by the end of all this, the states are a lookup table. Okay. So at the end, we try, so this is a shallow learning, as shallow as you can get. At the end, we, we realized that we could do everything with the lookup table. Yes? Uh, with the previous procedure, does it show some kind of a horizon effect? As what? Uh, some kind of a horizon effect? I mean, we're looking at Yes. Up. Yeah, sure. There's the problem of credit assignment. And then the beta is set in such a way that, uh, so the beta is set in such a way that it's the typical time that it takes to go from, uh, let's say, 100 meters to 1,000 meters. So beta is set by that 1 over 1 minus beta. That sets beta to be such that that horizon is of the order of 5 or 6 minutes. Yeah. OK. So just so that I understand, the yeah. actions are discrete in this case, right? You don't know Everything is discrete. Okay. Of course, it could be a neural net. And at the beginning, we tried neural nets. But then we realized that we could do everything with the lookup table. So the states are actually, well, let, let me describe the states. Maybe it's easier. So the states are bank angles. The bank angle is discretized. It can take two, four, six, seven states. So the bank angle can be in the range small bank angle around 0. So it means that you're flying essentially like this. Then minus 5, uh, plus 5 or minus 5, it means that you're inclined in the range discretized by 5 degrees like this, the opposite on that direction. And so these are the states of your bank angle. There's a similar states of your, uh, of your angle of attack that you can take. And these are the cues that you receive from the environment, which are also discretized. So the uh, vertical acceleration. When we did all this, we, uh, you will see the plot. We realized that the best cues in order to gain height are the vertical acceleration and the torque, which is the difference in the velocity on the, wind of the right, on the right wing and on the left wing. So it's kind of a difference how much the wind is trying to tilt you like this. And why is it useful? Because if the velocity on this side is higher than on this side, most probably the core of the thermal is on that side rather than on this side. So this is a very useful cue to tell you on which side the thermal, the core of the thermal is located. So we discretize the states, and we discretize the states of the environment as well, which can be strongly negative, zero, or strongly positive. And this is our states. This is what they are. 
So everything is discretized. Of course, you could do with neural nets, but you don't need to. Yes? So what are the, the triangles and the colors? Right. So this is the policy that emerges out of the learning. And depending on the level of Turman, but it's very similar in the two cases. So what the policy says is that imagine you're uh, sitting at zero bank angle. And you detect uh, the, the, the vertical acceleration and the torque are strongly negative, both of them. Okay? Then what you should do is should you, you should bank like crazy. Get out of here because it doesn't work. Right? The vertical acceleration is strongly negative. So it means that you are in a downdraft. Bank as much as you can because you have to get out of here. Okay? Uh, situation like this, you are uh, zero, there's a negative strong acceleration. Again, what you want to do is that you want to bank as much as possible. Uh, I don't know, something that is not banking like crazy. This one, for example. This means that if you're here, you want to you wanna stay in with the bank angle because this starts to be positive. The vertical acceleration is strongly positive. So you want to fly and stay within that region. This is the way you fly. This is what is getting implemented and the way the policy emerges. There was another question, yes? So you can go as high as you want, but in fact, in practice, because you put this limit of a few minutes over there, because the, fi the, the velocity is finite, you're not going to get to six kilometers. You're going to get to a few hundred meters. They could fall on the ground. That's part of the, that's part of the learning. And <laughs> by the way, when we did the experiment, we broke like four, five, four or five uh, planes. So it happens. It definitely happens. OK, so uh, I told you more or less this. I mean, the way the trajectories look like, this is before the learning. So it's starting here, and it's sinking. And this is the way the flight looks like at the end of the learning. Sensory motor cues, I think I already told you, it, what comes out to be the best is the uh, upward acceleration and the body rotation, so the angle. And you can see how it comes. So we tried many, many different things. And these two combined, they turn out to be essentially the best that you can possibly get. This one combined many other things. You put everything, but, but it's essentially the same thing. So that's the way we figured out that vertical acceleration and torque are the best that you can possibly have. OK, so now birds measure the, this quantity. This is ongoing work. I can tell you a little bit by the end. The question that we could address is whether or not this still works in the field, because the, the turbulent flow was uh, really a banal convection. We were doing thermals in a, in, a, in a pot rather than in the atmosphere. So the way we, we purchase uh, the gliders, which is a two meter wingspan, so it's a little one compared to the planes that I mentioned before with the glide ratio 40 to 1. This is clearly not in that class, but it costs uh, much less. Uh, there's a, a controller here, which I don't get into the details, but it's essentially allowing you to implement the strategy, meaning that it, it tells the glider which bank angle it should take, which pitch it should take, and it controls. And this plot is just to tell you that the, the controller is working fine whenever what you want to achieve is what you observe. So you have sensors that can sense Yes, that absolutely, control. yes. So, and to tell you, for example, if we hadn't done the simulation, we wouldn't know what kind of sensors to put. So we put the sensors, we put the GPS to get the acceleration, and we put a, a, a wind sensor in order to get the difference. And we extract, still, the problem is not completely obvious. Then we uh, drove to Poway, which is 20, 30 kilometers east of uh, San Diego. This is uh, Jerome uh, working very hard looking at the, at the glider. And uh, you leave the glider. So you, the, the glider still has a, an engine, which is getting used to, 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 to take off. It gets to 100 meters, and then you turn off the engine. And then it flies. It flies uh, without thrust. Uh, the, the engine is also useful to call it back, because sometimes because this is working well, uh, uh, it can fly actually for 45 minutes. And after 45 minutes of a good day, it can get two kilometers away. So there's a radio control, and you call it back. So the engine is useful in that as well. 
So how do you measure vertical acceleration? Well, there's a GPS, which is going to give you the velocity to the ground. And in order to get the velocity of the wind, you have to subtract the velocity of the glider itself. Here it's more complicated than what it looks because the aerodynamics can have all sorts of effects. In a plane, for example, you have these effects sometimes, I'm sure you've experienced, that you seem to be going up and down, up and down. This is called the fugoid effect. And these fugoid effects are very, uh, are usually not dangerous because the plane is flying very fast. But the period is of the order of G, uh, G the, the frequency is G over V. In our plane, which is, playing, uh, which is flying meters per second, this is of the order of hertz. So these are order seconds. So you have to be careful in subtracting all this stuff. That's where the work is, and it's, it's non-trivial. I'm, I'm making the story much easier than what it is. Same thing on the vertical velocity gradients. You have to pick up the uh, small differences. So speaking of the gradients to be measured, this is one other instance where it was the whole problem was to extract these small effects out of big numbers. And by the end of all this, so this is what the uh, glider does. And it's good that you don't see it because it means that it went very far, but it's here, over here. And it's been flying for about 20 minutes. So it's, uh, it's again, it learned to fly uh, in the field. Um, the way we did this is that we restarted the, whole, uh, the entire learning. So we started a, a, a scratch. And we learned again. And it took about a couple of days uh, of, of episodes of a few minutes. So out of a few hundred episodes uh, accumulated over like two or three days, this is what it was achieved. Yes? So it, okay, so it learns how to stay in the air. Yeah. But can it, can it, uh, you know, can it let's say, go from point A to point B? So that was not the purpose of this. But right. out of this experience, I now, uh, I said no at the beginning. Now I would say yes. Yes. But if I had to do that, I would include also visual cues, not just mechanical cues. Because you have GPS already. No, but I would use make visual cues in order to locate the clouds. If I have to go from point A to point B, there's an extremely important problem that you have to face, which is where's the next thermal? Right? Because you come out of a thermal. Now, how do you pick your glide angle? What you would like to do, unless you want to crash on the ground, is that you should be careful the way you glide. Because depending on the distance to the next thermal, you might be more or less conservative. If the next thermal is close, then you can sink. And, but nobody's going to tell you that the, the, the next thermal is going to be close. So you have a problem of estimating where's the next thermal. These glider pilots, they have a sense of where they are. But most of th what they do is that they estimate based on the clouds. Because when the hot air is coming up, it's going to get in the cold atmosphere up there, and it's going to release the humidity. It's going to condense, and it's going to form a cloud. So the best indicator of a thermal, active thermal, which is going up, is that you have a small cloud very well localized up in the air. So if I really want to fly from one point A to point B, I would like to make sure to know where's the next thermal. And the best indicator is a visual indicator, which is the clouds. Okay? So I would do it. I would use mechanical cues and visual cues. That'd be really cool. Let's do it. Uh, OK, so uh, I'll get to this in a second. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, the, these are the plots. These are some trajectories that here. Uh, these are a few more trajectories. Uh, so how much do I have? Three minutes. So just to say, uh, well, this is too much turbulence, so I'm going to skip this. Just to say that uh, we can estimate uh, you know, one problem is, uh, do we, can we really estimate the torque, for example? How much is the signal-to-noise ratio of the torque? How much is the uh, signal-to-noise ratio of the acceleration? So doing a little bit of turbulence and using simple uh, Kolmogorov scaling, you come up that the signal-to-noise ratio for the torque goes like this, where this is the velocity v, and this is the decision time uh, over which you change your bank angle. And this is the ratio for the acceleration. So these are what the plots look like. So they look very reasonable. Even for a bird having a couple of meters of wingspan, it's not easy to measure the torque. But there's a signal to noise ratio of about four. So it should be doable even for a bird of a couple 
of a couple of meters, that's certainly doable. So the plan is uh, on the so on the glider side it would be to do what I just said. On the bird side is to put the kind of instrumentation that was put on the glider, to put on the back of a bird, to have the signals coming out and to see the actions of the bird in response to these uh, signals and try and figure out what they do. And if you want to know more, these are the papers. And uh, I'm going to go back to Europe in, uh, uh, in the fall. So there's a, there's a position available in case you're interested. Just send me an email, or there's the, uh, that's the announcement. Thanks. <laughs> Dead? Yeah, it's late. OK. When they're learning from scratch, yes. they like yeah, they did. They did. They did. We have funded. We we got funded by Simon's Foundation, so the money that they gave was for the salary and for the the planes that crashed. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did absolutely. Because sometimes you know we we try to switch on the engine when it's going down, but sometimes it just just fell. So that's why that's how you try to save money. Yeah, but we we were not that successful. We <laughs> broke a few of them. Yes, we tried. We tried. We actually didn't break as many as I thought. Okay. Thank you.